Welcome to this very special featured speaker session with Grant Sanderson. Grant is the author of the incredible YouTube channel, Three Blue, One Brown, a channel that has over three and a half million subscribers. Actually, I just checked before this and it's 3.85 million now. Um, and on that channel, Grant breaks down mathematics into often unseen visual levels, which is exactly what he's going to do today for us, live here at SIGRA. I'd love everyone watching to share uh, where they're from in the Discord chat. Um, and it's also where you'll be able to ask questions of Grant while he's talking. Thank you so much for being here. And now it's over to you, Grant. Thank you very much, Ian, for that uh, extremely warm introduction. And to start off, first and foremost, I just want to extend my thanks to the conference as a whole, uh, not just you, Ian, for helping to organize all this, but especially to Paul Jeremias Vela for uh, kindly extending an invitation for me to take part here. Um, now, this particular session, for anyone watching, I really want it to be a little bit more interactive and less of a me streaming to you and something where we can hopefully uh, go back and forth with each other. So if you could do me a favor, and right now, um, preferably with your phone, but you could also do it on your computer, pull up the link that's on screen. So I've got a QR code there for if you want. Uh, a short link to it is 3b1b.co slash quiz. Um, and if you go there, what you should find is a certain quiz answer. And through the lecture today, I'm going to go through various quiz questions just to get a sense of where you guys are, both in terms of making sure that what I'm saying makes sense, but also questions that help me understand who the audience is. So, for example, if you go here, uh, what you should find is uh, one particularly silly question to start off with, where I'm asking... Which animal has fingerprints uh, that are so indistinguishable from humans that they have been confused at a crime scene? Um, and then as you answer, you'll see these uh, statistical bars kind of coming in. Um, and we don't see what those correspond to yet. I know that there's eight people who have given a certain common answer, now 9, 11. Um, but it's only once I choose to reveal that we'll see what those actually are. So in this case, while you're answering, while other people are rolling in, and uh, just in case you didn't see that link, to be sure, it's 3b1b.co slash quiz. That's where we'll be doing it uh, this whole time. What you should find is um, that uh, you're able to answer and contribute to all this. So in this case, even though some answers are still rolling in, I'm going to go ahead and finish and reveal it just to show what the correct answer is and also what a lot of people are answering. So this particular one, you know, obviously it's not about math or programmatic visualizations, um, but, you know, most people, it looks like, thought it was chimpanzees, perfectly reasonable. Turns out koalas. Who knew? Very human-like fingerprints in an example of uh, convergent evolution. Um, but of course, that's not what we're talking about today. Um, as Ian mentioned, I run a YouTube channel about math. And I talk about a lot of different aspects of math. So some of it is a little bit more applied. Like one of the more popular series on there is about neural networks and machine learning, particularly relevant here. But my own heart honestly lies with the much purer side of things. And sometimes merely finding a puzzle that I delight in or finding some phenomenon out there that maybe relates to really general things like Fourier series. It is impossible to overstate just how important Fourier series are and just trying to share in the delight of that. But one of the, I don't know, um, distinguishing features of the channel is that all of the visualizations are something that I'll create programmatically, sometimes in a way that maybe doesn't necessarily make sense, but I found just because how math and programming uh, go back and forth between each other where one can help inform the other Sometimes that helps for doing things that maybe wouldn't have been as easy to do otherwise, or I wouldn't have thought to do otherwise. But what I thought I would do today is essentially just really try to give a hard look at the question of when do these kinds of visualizations actually help in understanding math? You know, it's very easy to come up with something fancy that looks really nice. It's very pretty. But when is it that creating, in particular, a programmatic visualization actually helps someone to understand something they wouldn't have before? Because it's very easy to get lost in the idea of being flashy with things or lost in the idea of making it beautiful. But stepping back and asking when it matters can maybe help inform how those of us who are in this space move forward with it, and also those of us consuming it, how we choose which ones uh, we tend to spend more of our time with. So in this talk, I want to go through three different examples of using programmatic visualizations to put together some kind of explainer. The first one is related to chaos. Uh, the second one will be about linear algebra. And then the third about this funny little number system called quaternions, which computer graphics programmers might be more familiar with than the average person out there if you were to pull them off the street and ask if they've ever heard of a quaternion. So the very first example um, about chaos, and in particular double pendulums, is not actually something that I made. This is something I originally saw 
in an application for an internship that I was running this summer. It comes from a student named Sam uh, Maximovich, who's uh, studying computer science at UC Davis. And uh, there's two different reasons that I want to feature this particular thing, because I think it illustrates two very important principles that I want to talk about today, arguably the two most important principles. So in this particular video that he put together, this explainer, he starts by talking about something that we all might know and love, we might have seen, which is simulating a double pendulum. So that's when you've got one pendulum hanging off another pendulum. This is a ripe playground for creating fun different visualizations. Uh, in this case, you can have nice and idealized physical conditions, like saying there's no friction, so it can continue on and on. But the thing that makes double pendulums especially enticing to create, uh, especially if you're messing around with the programming and you just want to simulate what will happen, is that they're chaotic. And what we mean by chaotic is that if you have two different initial conditions that are similar to each other, you know, they're very close to each other, they will, without too much time, end up wildly different from each other. So for this particular um, graphic, the way that we're going to illustrate this is by looking in a plot on the right. And what this plot is going to show is on the x-axis, the angle of the first pendulum, and then on the y-axis, the angle of the second pendulum. So for example, in both cases, they start off close to uh, 90 degrees. And we're going to follow two different lines. One of them will be colored blue for the blue pair of pendulums, one yellow for the yellow pair of pendulums. And they both start to decrease. Now, the full state space of this situation, the full view of uh, the conditions for a particular pendulum, would also have to take into account the angular velocity. So I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind, that really we're just looking at a two-dimensional slice of the full situation. But even in this two-dimensional slice, there's quite a bit going on, where you can see that after not too long, even though they started off quite similar to each other, you have completely different trajectories doing completely different things. But of course, if you want to visualize this, you know, just looking at two conditions doesn't necessarily get you a sense that every possible set of initial conditions, or at least many of the possible initial conditions, end up deviating a lot. So the reason I wanted to feature this particular uh, video is that Sam did something that I thought was rather clever, and which requires a computer if you want to ask the question. To even ask the question without a computer almost doesn't make sense. What he did is said, okay, I want to look at for any, a particular set of initial conditions, like for example, maybe both the pendulums start off at 90 degrees. So on this plot here, I'm saying that the first angle is pi halves, which is in radians, 90 degrees. And then the second one is pi halves, again, 90 degrees. And as you let it evolve, I want to associate each possible state of this system with a different color. So he assigned a color to each point in the grid. So for example, um, if we back up and we look at the initial spot, it looks like it's roughly greenish. And it's not a unique coloring. There's going to be another place on this plane that's also greenish. But what you can know for sure is that if two colors, um, if two states are very different from each other, uh, they, they might have very different colors. Um, and this might give us a sense of whether things that start off close to each other end up farther apart. Because then, if each possible initial condition just has a color, what you can do is ask the question, what happens when I do this to every single initial condition that I can think of associated with each pixel on the grid, okay? So what he's gonna do is say, for each pixel in the space, I'm gonna let that represent the initial condition of some double pendulum. I'm gonna let that double pendulum evolve, as physics would say that it should evolve, and I'm gonna change the color of that pixel based on this color map that's associating each of those states with some kind of color. So here I wanna ask you, what do you think is gonna happen when we do this? So if we turn over to our quiz and get away from the <laughs> koala question, and instead I ask, what do you expect will happen to the colors of that particular grid when we let each one of those pixels represent a double pendulum? As the double pendulum that it represents evolves, what's going to happen is that pixel is going to slowly start changing colors. But different pixels might change colors in different ways, depending on what that initial condition is. Now, the options I've given you here is that the entire image is going to tend towards some kind of uniform color. Um, maybe just a subset of that image tends towards some kind of uniform color the entire image will tend to look like noise, just total random noise, or a subset of that image will tend to look like random noise. Okay, so as the answers are coming in, I also want to mention that I'll, I'll do some uh, question and answer time uh, if there is you know, enough time for it at the end of the talk. And if you do want to ask questions, the place to do that will be on the Discord channel. Uh, it's the one that's programmatic visualizations in mathematics. So already we have some people um, <laughs> making various comments, talking about 
the trails for showing the states over time, things like that. If you want to ask a question, uh, throw it into the Discord, and especially towards the end, that's where I'm going to be looking at them. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and finish and reveal here just to see where people's minds are. Um, okay, so it's between C and D for the entire image will tend to look like noise versus a subset. Now, C is a very justifiable answer, and arguably, depending on how you interpret the question, could be the right answer. But if we uh, turn back over to see how these things will play out, um, there's actually someone who, after this video was made, created an interactive version online, and I thought that's maybe the best place that we can go to look at it. So this right here represents, again, each pixel is representing some double pendulum. And if I hover my mouse over it, it'll show you which particular double pendulum. And as I move my mouse to a different spot over a different pixel, it'll show that one. And we have this absolutely beautiful image that pops out. I mean, for one thing, it's very psychedelic to look at it with the colors waving across. But more than that, it actually carries a little bit of meaning if we take a moment to think about it. So if I stop the evolution here, and I just ask the question, what does it mean that we have so much noisiness all around the edge? Like if you render this into a video, by the way, it ends up as a absurdly high data video just because it's so incompressible with all of this noise. What that's showing you is what chaos means. It's saying that if you slightly tweak the initial condition, you move to a neighboring pixel, the state of that pendulum ends up wildly different. And the way that that manifests here is a wildly different color. But one thing that's especially interesting is that not everything looks like noise. And you can take a moment to think about why would it be the case that near the center, we don't have that noisiness? And the answer is that in a certain range, the double pendulum is not chaotic. Even if you have initial conditions that are close to each other play out over a long period of time, they end up roughly similar to each other. Those that have very low energy, they both start off with low angles, tend to be similar, which manifests as a not noisy image. But what really surprised me actually upon looking at this, and I don't even know how you would have phrased this question without deciding to get a program to simulate all of this in a way that could be visual like this, is why you have strange little patches of non-chaos even around others that are. Like if we zoom in right here and really interpret what does this section of things mean, it's telling you that for whatever reason around these initial conditions, all the neighbors tend to evolve in like kind. Even though very nearby, you get something that's much more chaotic, where instead things will become wildly different if they have uh, similar initial conditions. But you also have these strange little islands of stability just randomly off uh, in a corner here. So that, uh, <laughs> that particular image just blew my mind uh, when I saw it, and I thought it was a very clever way to illustrate this particular idea. And I think it illustrates, like I said, two important features about programmatic visualizations that I want to talk about today. And the first thing is about how a good programmatic visualization should sometimes feel like a surprise. And it shouldn't necessarily be something where you had a crystal clear image of what you wanted it to look like, and it was merely a matter of going and making the computer do that. Sometimes if instead you have a piece of math, and that math really lends itself to being encoded in rules, and those rules can be manifested as a particular image. And then what comes out has nothing, nothing to do with what you might have imagined because your brain isn't capable of imagining it. You had to see it play out. That's the time when you really start to ask much more interesting questions. Like what on earth is going on with these strangely stable reasons, regions in an otherwise chaotic circumstance? And if you look at the history of chaos theory in particular, you know, relative to a lot of other math, it's pretty recent. It's really just in the last century. And it definitely has progressed in lockstep with computing itself. You know, when Lorenz was initially coming up with uh, certain weather models and realized that you can have chaos even when there's not a lot of parameters, it had to do with actively simulating it. When Mandelbrot was creating the first images of the Mandelbrot set, you know, printing them out on paper with little asterisks over the various spots where it might converge, it was getting a computer to start to show something where no one would have even thought to ask the question of what this thing looked like without simulating it. Now, the second principle that this illustrates, I want to get back to towards the end of the talk. Uh, but before then, I want to talk about a second case where it doesn't have to be so fancy. Maybe the idea of holding yourself to this standard of making sure that the visual is unexpected, that's more for the sake of generating research questions. I think there's still a lot that can be done to help elucidate certain topics, even if you know exactly what it'll look like. And it's actually much more unsophisticated uh, when you're coming up with things. So one of the things that I've created on the channel, which I've gotten the most thanks for, the most gratitude for, is also in some sense the least interesting from a computer graphics standpoint. I did a series about linear algebra, 
and uh, kind of the basis to thinking about matrices and vectors in a highly visual way. And it consists of about 16 videos. And I'll, I'll show you the heart of it. I'll show you just the heart of what the series was founded on here in a moment. But the thing I want you to notice is that the graphics required for this aren't necessarily, you know, let's say up to SIGGRAPH snuff in terms of state of the art, uh, things that you couldn't have done with a computer 10 years prior. Um, there is still an aspect of it where I think being programmatic offers a benefit, but it's not in the same way that it's a necessity, how it was with chaos. So the, the basic idea is if you want to think about a matrix, you know, we've got some two by two matrix here, A, B, C, D. The thing to note is that uh, supposing you have learned about the rules of matrix vector multiplication, you don't have to suppose that we could start elsewhere, but supposing you have, you might notice that if you multiply it by the vector one zero, which uh, has a unit length, it's length one sitting in the x direction, the result effectively pulls out the first column of that vector. And very similarly, if you were to multiply it by zero one, which is the vector that has length one, but it's pointing in the y direction, uh, doing that pulls out the second column of the, uh, of the matrix. And of course, you could go beyond two dimensions with this. This would also apply in three dimensions. You'd also have the third column uh, representing what happens to the, uh, the unit vector in the z direction. But what this tells you is when you look at a matrix, you can basically read it by looking at those columns and telling you what happens to these two special vectors. And just to kind of see what page everyone's on, I'm not entirely sure what comfort people have with linear algebra. Part of me assumes that it's strong comfort, but just as a nice, simple warm-up question, um, I'm going to give you an example of a matrix. I'm going to say what effect does multiplying by the matrix with columns 0, 1, and negative 1, 0, what effect does that have on a vector? And uh, just to kind of show you what the setup here is, I've got this matrix, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, you know, kind of insinuating that in this context, it might be helpful to think of in terms of the columns. And the question is, what is that, uh, what is that going to do? So especially because sometimes there's a little lag on the live side of things here, and especially because sometimes it helps to just think about some math, you know, if you haven't seen it in quite a while. Um, I'll give you just a moment for answers to roll in here. And as those are rolling in, I will give you the opportunity to cheat uh, by just showing it. Um, in this case, that first column is telling us that the green vector is going to go to 0, 1, you know, unit length in the y direction, and the red vector is going to go to negative 1, 0. That's a negative 1 in the x direction. So as we play that out, it rotates things 90 degrees counterclockwise. So if I uh, go back over to our quiz, and I take a look, it looks like most of you correctly answered that it rotates uh, 90 degrees counterclockwise. And um, the rest of you answering D, flipping around uh, x, y equals negative x. Um, not a bad guess. Uh, I think if you were flipping around that line, that would have taken, that would correctly have taken the uh, second vector, the one that starts at 0, 1 in the y direction, it would have um, flipped it around uh, to the spot negative 1, 0. But it actually would have acted differently on the x vector. So point being, this is kind of a nice way to think about a matrix, think of it acting on space. But here, I've already pulled a little bit of sleight of hand, which is to say, just by following these two special vectors, I seem to be insinuating that the rest of the grid necessarily follows. But is that the case? I mean, just because we know what happens to the unit vector in the x direction or the unit vector in the y direction, why should everything get rotated 90 degrees like that? That's not exactly obvious. And so, you know, the key to that comes down to uh, this property known as linearity. And you know, it's got a fancy word to it. It's you know, the etymological basis for why we call it linear algebra. But all it's really saying is that if we take this matrix and we multiply it by some vector, let's call that vector x, y. So it's got some um, component in the x direction, like the one pictured here, has negative 1 in the x direction and 2 in the y direction. That if you break it apart by saying x times the first column and y times the second column, that is the same thing as our usual definition of a matrix vector product. And again, a more fun way you could go about this is to first describe what linear transformations are and then discover what vector matrix multiplication should look like. Um, what you could do is say that a linear transformation is one where if before the transform, you have a vector represented with this particular combination of the you know, vector in the x direction, vector in the y direction, that even after the transformation, after this 
uh, function has acted on every single possible vector in the plane, so that every single vector still has that property, that whatever its x-coordinate was, it now has that in a sort of new coordinate system. So here, for example, where our vector v ended up, it's still negative 1 times the green vector plus 2 times the red vector. And so visually, there's a very nice way to think about what this property means. Um, it's that when you apply this kind of transform, the grid lines remain parallel and evenly spaced. So examples of transforms like that that are useful, simple things like rotation. You rotate the grid, the grid lines remain parallel and evenly spaced. If you scale it up, they remain parallel and evenly spaced. Um, but the other power that this puts in someone's hands is to say, anytime you see a matrix, maybe in a completely different context, you're doing some machine learning, you're analyzing a graph and looking at the connectivity, however it pops up, you have the option of thinking about it as transforming space. Um, so for example, in this particular matrix that I have up here, the uh, x vector, the unit vector in the x direction, we know is going to go to the coordinates 3, 1. You could kind of picture in your head the idea of that vector moving to a spot that has coordinates 3, 1. And similar, the other, uh, the other column tells you where the other vector is going to go. And you have this picture of grid lines moving. And if you wanted to know where some particular other vector goes, one that would say, you know, negative one in the x direction, two in the y direction, again, it, the key is that it retains the certain property where it's um, that same combination, but of our new transformed vectors. So in this context, it would be negative one times that green plus two times that red. And... You know, of course, doing this uh, with full time, or if you're giving a class for it, or generating the proper series, you would uh, go into more examples. Why would you use this? Who cares? Um, one particular example that comes up, as many of you know, in the context of graphics programming, is to think about rotations. You want to reorient something in 3D space. A really nice way to think about that is to say what matrix reorients it. And you can think about that matrix very concretely. That first column tells you what happens to the unit vector in the x direction. That second column to the unit vector in the y direction. And you can kind of read it here. It's telling you that its x-coordinate is close to zero, the y-coordinate is pretty high, the z-coordinate is up a little. You can think through some of the properties like how each one of these columns should be a unit vector, the sum of their squares should be one, or they should be perpendicular to each other, that that's what constrains a matrix to describe rotation as opposed to other things. Um, now, my point is just that with that, as a category of visualizations, where we're indicating what matrices do with a kind of motion, you know, where do you start and then you transition to where you end. Um, you can actually explain quite a bit that a lot of linear algebra students can sometimes be frustrated with when it's more static and formulaic on the blackboard. Things like what is a determinant? Um, when we're solving systems of equations by calculating an inverse matrix, what's the intuition for how that inverse matrix comes about? Or even things like the dot product and the cross product. You can understand where the formulas for those come from and why they have the properties we claim they do through the lens of linear transformations. You know, a huge one is eigenvectors and things like that. And my reason for bringing this up, like I said, this is, of the things I've made, maybe the ones that I've got the most thanks for, you know, people writing personal notes, just hundreds and hundreds of them, about how it was a welcome contrast from what they were learning in school. And like I said, what's funny to me is it's not exactly sophisticated imagery. I think the benefit here the programming provided was more one of providing this uh, different medium on which I could put the stuff out there, where once you have a little bit of infrastructure, to, you're just drawing lines and some symbols on those lines. It actually made it relatively quick to produce the whole series in comparison to how long I'll often spend on some other videos. Because once the infrastructure is there and you've created your own little world, that is the, now I'm explaining linear algebra world, it wasn't that much longer to create those than if it was trying to prepare lectures, even just a good you know, slide given talk or a uh, Blackboard lecture. And you could do it with other animation software. You don't need a programmatic approach, although even animation software, of course, leverages computer graphics. But the idea of it, the control being in your own hand there has more to do with creating the landscape for a different medium that's bespoke to the thing that you're trying to explain. Because there's really no hope that I would find out there tailor-made linear algebra explaining software. No one is going to make that unless they're already making the series associated with it. And so that's something to keep in mind. As easy as it is to focus on the things that are most beautiful or most state-of-the-art sophisticated, sometimes just realizing that creating a different medium for a particular thing uh, is actually where the programming can shine. But I think a much more, I don't know, on, on topic for SIGGRAPH uh, example would come from is something where the graphics themselves are interesting, where it's not just a matter of lines moving around on the screen. Um, and here, I think one of the most fun projects I've had the pleasure of working on uh, had to do with these 
funny little objects called quaternions. And so just out of curiosity, I do want to have some sense of where the audience is in terms of uh, your comfort with or familiarity with quaternions. Uh, so the next question, if you go to that same poll, which again, it's 3b1b.co slash quiz, which redirects you to itempool.com slash 3b1b slash live. Um, the four different options here are that you've never heard of them and right? totally unfamiliar. You've heard of them, but you've never used them. So some strange four-dimensional number system, but you know it hasn't come up in your work. But you've actually used them. You know, there's some project where it's come up, but you didn't really feel comfortable with them. Or you actually feel quite comfortable with them already. Um, and here, this will help me inform because there's, there's a wide spectrum of levels of depth that I could go into on the topic of quaternions. Because one, boy, do I love them. Just as a math nerd, I've, I've thought about four-dimensional things since I was very little. And the idea of trying to visualize four-dimensional things productively has been strangely on my mind <laughs> through my life. Because so many interesting things happen in four dimensions that don't happen in three. And it's so frustrating not to be able to see it and touch it. And that's one of the things that was particularly mm, rewarding about this particular project. Um, but also what kind of tickles me is the thought that there's a utility to it. Often when people look at strange math that describes higher dimensions, it seems like mathematicians whose heads are up in the clouds and they've been detached from reality since reality is three-dimensional, maybe four if we count time. But quaternions give this really good example where it actually has nothing to do with spatial dimension or like trying to incorporate time as a fourth dimension or anything like that. It's just that the pure geometry of what happens in four dimensions carries with it an unexpected utility to trying to describe three dimension. Um, okay, so it looks like most answers have rolled in at this point. And the most common answer uh, to be expected from a graphics conference uh, is people who have used them, but they say they don't feel comfortable with them. We have some people who feel comfortable with them. So <laughs> for those of you, I hope you uh, are enjoyable just staying along with the ride. Um, people have heard of them, but never used. And then the last category is people have never heard. Great, so that, that's actually quite helpful. So I can know that uh, there is a, a certain level of familiarity already. So before we actually, actually, you know what I, I wanna do is maybe to show you um, a little bit of where we're leading here. So the reason I mentioned this being a, an exciting project that I worked on, it's not, the bulk of it is actually not on YouTube, but a collaborator named Ben Eder, who I met uh, when I worked at Khan Academy, um, he and I put together this series of what we call explorable videos. So if you click on it, you hear my voice explaining it. And it's it starts off like any other explainer video, you know, I'm describing something, there's some visuals on there. But the difference is that at any point you can pause and you can actually play with the environment. So the, the structure of the explanation is to be narrating while I'm playing with this environment, but anyone who wants to can kind of stop and start tweaking it themselves. Um, so in this setting, you know, it might not entirely be clear what is represented in the upper left. There's definitely a lot of information there, a lot going on, but someone tweaking it around could see that, okay, something about changing the four numbers associated with this uh, value Q, which presumably is a quaternion, dictates a different orientation in three-dimensional space. Um, and indeed, this is one of the main motives for uh, using quaternions, is the way that they can describe orientation in 3D space and how they do it in some sense more elegantly than um, alternate approaches. But before we get into that, I, it's worth actually just motivating it a little bit. Why would we need something else that describes orientation in 3D space? Because, you know, I was just talking about linear algebra. Linear algebra already offers a really nice way to describe the orientation of something. Let's say you've got some object and uh, you want to consider you know, some position to be the um, this initial position. And for any other one, you can say, what is the matrix that transforms it into that other position? And I'll just use that matrix to describe the orientation. So for example, maybe I wanted this to be rotated um, about the y-axis. Then you know, I've got a new matrix here. And the first column tells us what happens to the x-coordinate that it's sitting in the negative z direction. The next column tells us that the y-coordinate actually stayed static. It still uh, just has a unit length in the y-direction. And the last column tells us that the z-coordinate ends up where the x-coordinate now is. Who needs, who needs something different, especially some bizarre four-dimensional number system? Um, but if, if you notice, actually, here, the way that I was transitioning from one state to another, I was just having each index of the matrix linearly interpolate to the alternate index. Uh, 
which you know isn't exactly that desirable. It sort of uh, squishes the object on its way there. In between, it's not describing a nice orthogonal rigid motion. It's uh, it's shrinking a little bit, and this becomes especially bad if you were to interpolate between two orientations that are a 180 degree angle apart. So, let's say I was uh, moving this so that it was 180 degrees off. Just doing the naive thing of interpolating directly between the coordinates of this matrix means that for all of those in-between states, you know, at some point we actually get to where the x vector and the z vector are both zero. So it squishes the thing entirely to zero. Uh, and you've got all this sort of awkwardness. And, you know, maybe you'd hope for some kind of means of normalizing it along the way. It's not entirely clear how you would do that. There's this notion of a Gram-Schmidt process to turn any matrix into an orthogonal matrix. Uh, but whether that would behave the way you want or continuously, not entirely clear. The one, one approach to this uh, that's definitely the most intuitive and friendly, and anyone who's computing, uh, doing programming with computer graphics would like to tend to this as the first one because it's just so nice to think about, um, is to use these things called Euler angles, where you sort of imagine your object sitting inside a gimbal, and you describe three different angles, one for how it rotates about the z-axis, one for how it rotates about a different axis, and then a third one for how it rotates about yet a different axis. And essentially, you can describe any orientation you want in 3D space by specifying what these three angles are. And then it's nice and intuitive to think about. You're like, OK, I just need to actually picture my object rotating about those. And once you have those angles, you can construct the relevant rotation matrix. Essentially, you take the rotation associated with each one of them, and you compose them all together. And one of the big lessons of linear algebra is that matrix multiplication describes doing one transformation after the other. So you'd say, OK, interpolation shouldn't be a problem anymore. I just describe some Euler angles, describe some new Euler angles, and I interpolate between them. Uh, but that can definitely cause all sorts of issues, because uh, sometimes you end up with one angle moving more than you wanted it to. And one of the most delightful examples I think I've seen of this uh, showed up on the Reddit for FIFA, where someone found a particular edge case that happened in a particular moment where one of the character's heads definitely does not behave as intended. So if you kind of back up here, you've got some initial state, an initial orientation for the head. And then the way that it's getting interpolated to the new state is definitely not the natural one. And I, I can't speak to what the lines of code underlying that actually looked like. But I'm going to assume that they were using Euler angles. And I can almost guarantee that they weren't using quaternions. Because if you use quaternions to describe the orientation in 3D space, everything just kind of magically works. So what I've got on the right here is um, I'm showing a set of four numbers. And at the moment, I'm asking that you believe me that there is a consistent way to associate this quadruplet of numbers with a given orientation in 3D space. Um, but the point I want to start off with, just as a little bit of motivation for why anyone would care, is that if you just do the naive thing and you have these numbers directly interpolate uh, to where you want them to be, to the new set of four numbers that will describe a new orientation, then all you have to do is make sure that along the way they're always normalized, that the sum of the squares of these numbers equals one, which has a pretty intuitive meaning I can show you in a moment. But if that's the only thing you do, and it's always possible to normalize in that way, that as you're interpolating between different orientations, it just works. It just always does the thing that you want. And there's never any arbitrary directions where something bad happens. It's not like, oh, make sure that one of your vectors isn't pointing in the pure z direction. Otherwise, you might run into some issues. Sort of every single one of the orientations is treated equal, and interpolating them uh, between them will always work nicely. And a picture you might have in your mind here is that that quadruplet of numbers, if you want to say, all of the sum of their squares needs to be one. What you're effectively saying is that up in four dimensions, which we can't visualize, which is frustrating to no end, but we'll get to that in a moment. Up in four dimensions, each one of them sits on a point on a sphere. You know, in two dimensions, all the points where the distance from the origin is one constitute a circle. In three dimensions, all the points whose distance from the origin is one constitute a sphere. Up in four dimensions, it's a similar game. All of the points where the distance from the origin as measured by the square root of the sum of the squares of the coordinates, all of that, um, they constitute a hypersphere. And if you want to interpolate between two of these points, and what you do is say, I'm going to draw the line directly connecting them, and then for each point on the line, I just project it straight out onto the sphere, then you have a natural way to walk along the sphere to get to a new uh, quaternion. And if you believe me, 
that individual quaternions, individual points on a hypersphere, actually correspond to uh, orientations in three dimensions. This offers kind of a nice solution to the problem that Euler angles or naive interpolation between matrices um, doesn't necessarily provide. But, uh, of course, this raises a question, which is, what the heck is a quaternion? What sense of four-dimensional, uh, uh, what four-dimensional mm, geometry could possibly relate to 3D orientations in this way? And why are you describing it as a kind of number? And one way to answer this, um, if we want to motivate all of this, is to just look at the algebra. Um, unfortunately, it's not very elucidating. Uh, it gives rules that you can put into your computer. So if you want to confirm for yourself that these will just magically work, um, step one is to define this idea of quaternion multiplication, where if I've got one of them that has four different components, and then another one that also has four different components, then to produce the output uh, of this product, which again will have four components, each one of those components has a certain formula associated with it. Total mess, if you look at it like this, definitely not. A friendly introduction to it. It is what naturally emerges if you say that multiplication distributes the way that you would expect, and then also you assign some rules for how these special constants i, j, and k relate to each other. And we call these uh, constants i, j, and k the imaginary parts of the quaternion. So it's highly analogous to complex numbers where you have a real part and then an imaginary part, but it's sort of like there's two other imaginary dimensions. And it turns out we have a nice and consistent system if we have two other imaginary directions and they obey, the, obey these rules. But again, it's very frustrating because it doesn't really give you any instinct for why that would work. Um, and if you're someone like me, what you especially want is a way to picture just in your head, like what is actually going on, preferably in four dimensions. Uh, but it gets a little bit more confusing than that, because if, again, you want to carry this out and say, great, I'll trust you that this magical multiplication rule actually works um, in some way, a lot of details are left out to say, okay, what, what do you do with that in order to uh, describe some orientation? It's not as simple as it is with matrices, where you just take the matrix describing the orientation and you multiply it by the vector. Instead, you actually have to do two products, all the more confusing potentially. Where let's say you've got some point that you want to rotate. So maybe it represents uh, like a, a corner on the box of the object that you want to have moving through space. What you do is you'll take the relevant quaternion, which I have yet to tell you how to construct, but I will in a moment, um, and you multiply by that quaternion from the left, and then you multiply by its inverse on the right. You kind of sandwich your point, which is being described as a purely imaginary quaternion. Um, you sandwich it with Q and Q inverse. And you might you know, question at this point, why do Q and Q inverse not cancel each other out? And the answer is that uh, the rules for multiplication here don't obey quite the same ones that you expect from things like real numbers or complex numbers. In particular, order matters. If you do A times B, that's different from B times A. So in this context, if you do Q multiplied by some point times Q inverse, the Q and the Q inverse don't necessarily cancel each other out. Now, it turns out there's a very good reason and a highly intuitive reason why you should do this sandwiching operation. Uh, but just seeing the rule at first, especially when you can't picture the four dimensions, like I said, um, it doesn't necessarily make clear why that would happen. So just to show you how you would construct these quaternions first, before we get into the fun stuff of actually trying to wrap our minds into the four dimensions, I just want to take a step back and think of a much simpler circumstance, which is describing two-dimensional rotation, but describing it using complex numbers. Because there, it's another situation where once you understand linear algebra, you could use a matrix. You could use a rotation matrix, and that would be fine. But there's a kind of elegance to using uh, complex numbers. If for no other reason, it's computationally simpler. It, revol it involves fewer multiplications. You only have to store a pair of real numbers in order to describe a given rotation. You don't have to describe uh, four different numbers for the entries of the matrix. And as a very concrete example, imagine that you were asked to compute what happens when you take a vector with coordinates 4, 1, and you want to rotate it 30 degrees, and you'll get to some new vector. From the picture, you can tell that it'll be something whose x-coordinate is a little less than 3, something whose y-coordinate is a little less than 3. But how do you actually compute that exactly? Um, in particular, how do you do it if we're using complex numbers? Now, the thing about complex numbers is when you multiply that by them, a nice way to think about it is that 
For any particular number, let's call this one z, when you multiply by zero, you still get zero. So zero has to stay fixed in place, it's sort of like it's pinned in. And when you multiply by one, well, you'll get the number itself. One times z is equal to z. What I like to picture in my head is fixing zero in place and then moving the number one to wherever that z is. And what that lets you viscerally feel is the fact that as long as that complex number sits somewhere on the unit circle, it has a distance one from the origin, then the resulting motion is something that is pure rotation. There's no scaling to it. So all of the complex numbers sitting somewhere on that unit circle give us an elegant way to describe pure rotation. So for our example, the first step that you would do would be to find a complex number that sits 30 degrees away from the number one, something so that if you were dragging the number one up to that, it would require rotating things 30 degrees. Then you represent the point we care about also as a complex number. And then kind of like magic, you just let the algebra play out. And this is one of the things that I actually find quite delightful sometimes in math, where you can have fun little pictures in your mind where you twisting around space and I'm morphing it in some way. And trust me, as I multiply by this uh, matrix, we're going to morph all of space like this. But to step back and realize that actually this is connected to a very concrete set of operations that you can do to geometrically calculate something that otherwise would have been quite hard, it sometimes just feels magic when it pops out. Like in this case, if you carry out the product of these complex numbers, maybe for some of us, we have to think back to high school, okay, what does it mean to multiply complex numbers? All you're doing is distributing it. You're doing your first inside, outside, last. So we've got our cosine of 30 times the number four kind of sitting there. You've got your sine of 30 times i um, multiplied by four, and you also have the cosine of 30 times one, and you carry it all out and you organize which parts um, are real, don't have any i's in them, which parts are imaginary that have an i in them. And if you put this in your computer and you just have it calculated out, it will get you a pair of numbers for the real part and the imaginary part. And that actually, if you draw it out, lines up pretty much with where you would expect it to fall um, for what looks like a 30 degree rotation of this little number. So I want you to remember this. What we did is we found a complex number where the real part is the cosine of a certain angle and the imaginary part is the sine of that angle. And that as a complex number described rotation of 2D space by that angle. Okay, so the rule for quaternions for how to find which quaternion corresponds to 3D rotation, ends up looking quite similar. And if we want to do it and understand how this particular set of four numbers is chosen to give us a particular orientation, uh, let me take us back to the uh, interactive space here. So the first thing I'm going to do, uh, let me go ahead and, and pause it here, is um, switch the mode of interaction where... <laughs> Uh, you can't quite see this, but my, my Zoom controls are in the way of my uh, quaternion controls. All right, here we go. So uh, first of all, just to lay out what we have up here, I am defining that quaternion sandwich the same way that I mentioned to you before, where we're going to define a number Q, where I'm about to tell you how to construct it. I'm going to also show you the inverse of Q on the other side. Um, and then we're going to see what it does to various points. So for example, the point I that's sitting one unit in the x direction, the point j that's sitting one unit in the y direction, and so on. And here's my claim. If we construct one where the, co the real part looks like the cosine of some angle, and then the imaginary part looks like sine of some angle times a unit vector. So for example, here that unit vector is just in the x direction. Um, then that describes rotation around that vector. So if instead that unit vector was sitting up in the y direction, so in this case, if I set it equal to j, then it's in the y direction. Then as I tweak this angle, what it'll get me is different rotations around the y-axis. Now I want you to pay attention because pretty shortly from now, I'm going to ask you a quiz question where I want you to construct the appropriate quaternion for this map. So I want it to be very clear. The real part is the cosine of the relevant angle. The imaginary part is the sine of that angle times some combination of three values. You think of this combination of three values as being a unit vector. In particular, they have to have um, a unit length. You'll notice as I'm changing one of these numbers, the other ones are going down, kind of like a game of whack-a-mole. And the reason is that it always has to be constrained so that the sum of the squares of these numbers always equals one. So let's say I wanted a vector where, you know, let's not have any rotation. I wanted it to have equal parts in the x and y direction. So as I move up the value for j, 
you know, it's also changing the value for I. And I think if I get it to, I think 0.71 should be about when they're equal. Yeah, about there. This will give me a vector where they're both equal. Now, if you were just playing around with this, and any of you can do this now if you want, you go to eater.net slash quaternions. Um, this will give you, uh, land you on the page where you can play with this. What you could notice is, okay, as I'm changing this angle, it rotates around that vector, but not in the way that you might expect. For example, if I change this angle up to 45 degrees, what I want you to notice is that it's actually rotated things 90 degrees. So just follow what happens to that number K. It starts up on the z-axis, and after I change this to 45, it's actually rotated 90 degrees. And a way that you can think about this is that the value Q on the left is doing 45 degrees of the motion, and the value Q inverse on the right is doing another 45 degrees. So this is why you always have to double it. And in particular, if I went up to 90 degrees, um, that actually gets me something which is a 180 degree rotation. And it's really because both of these are doing the heavy lifting. Now, again, I haven't really mentioned what's going on in four dimensions or why we would need four different coordinates to describe orientation like this. But just with this, hopefully it gives some sense of uh, when I say a particular set of four numbers can correspond to an orientation, a given motion three dimensions, uh, how it does so. And so let me, let me ask you a quiz question here, which will be the hardest of the quiz questions that I've asked so far, actually, where, again, let me move things along, begin accepting answers. So this is the challenge question for the day. This is the one where I would be most tickled if we could get everybody answering this, um, with just everyone answering it, but answering it correctly, if possible. Suppose we want to choose some quaternion Q, so that the function that I was just defining where you have this kind of sandwich around a point. You input a point and you multiply it by Q on the left, Q inverse on the right. We want it to take on the following values. We want it to move I to J. Unit vector in the X direction should go to the Y direction. J to K and then K to I. So it's a little tricky to think about, but you might picture in your head the X, Y, and Z directions and you want the X direction to go to the Y axis, the Y axis to go to the Z axis and the Z axis to go to the X axis. And it's asking you, what should that quaternion be? For this particular way that we can rotate 3D space, that will swap the three axes in this particular way, what should the triplet of quaternions be? And so far, we've got some answers in. And reassuringly, it looks like we've got uniformity among the answers, which is always reassuring. So I'll give you a, a couple moments to make sure answers are coming in there. And we've also got two others, so curious to see how that goes. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna give a very brief check over to the Discord page, um, just to see if there's any particular things I should be mindful of or questions. And also, by the way, I'm gonna scroll through the Discord and um, answer other questions after this also. So certainly if I don't have time to answer it, feel free to ask. Um, defining a plane instead of an axis. Lots of good fodder for discussion here. Ah, uh, yes, I was going to talk about geometric algebra a little bit. Um, so on the, on the topic of geometric algebra, this is an alternate way that you can describe uh, rotations and orientations, um, which it works just as well. Mathematically, it ends up being the same thing. It's just another way to conceptualize it. As a math nerd, I'm sort of tickled by the idea of what happens in four dimensions that doesn't happen in others, and the fact that knowing why quaternions do what they do can come down to reasoning in, in four dimensions. But for just right now, I'll go ahead and blink and reveal. So it looks like most of you got the correct answer here. So the intuition is essentially we want to first come up with a vector that is equally spaced in all three directions. So it might be a little bit tricky with this app, but I can get it maybe 57. That's around the square root of three or one over the square root of three, I think. And what would be nice is if I could just type it in. But if you have something like that, then once we change this angle to be 60 degrees, which corresponds to 120 degrees as an actual rotation, then that'll do what we want. It moves I up to the y-axis, J up to the z-axis, and K over to the y-axis. So congrats on getting that one correct. Um, where the story would go, by the way, if we had more time, is to talk about how what you're looking at here is not actually 3D space, um, but this is a certain projection of 4D space. And if we unlock these quaternions, and just try to think about multiplication one at a time, just from the one on the left and just from the one on the right, um, 
what we're actually seeing is a projection of just a slice of a hypersphere. And it's a bit confusing at first, but if you break it down in the right way, and this is exactly what the interactive video series was all about, um, you isolate yourself just to the correct uh, subsets of that hypersphere that you might want to look at. There's a very nice rule, actually, for what quaternion multiplication is doing in four dimensions that basically feels like two rotations that are perpendicular to and in sync with each other. And that statement might not necessarily make too much sense. So the way that we go through it is we kind of walk through the idea of projecting a circle onto a line, imagining describing complex numbers to a creature that just understands one dimension, and then stepping it up and describing projecting a sphere into two dimensions, and trying to describe the idea of rotating a sphere in two dimensions, uh, rotating a sphere in three dimensions to a creature that only understands two dimensions, um, and things like telling him, hey, that circle that you're looking at uh, is actually the same as the one we're looking at, that yellow circle. But to us, we think of it as the equator of a sphere. And as we start to rotate that sphere in other ways, you see that circle seem to warp and even transform into a straight line. And that's highly analogous to what we see here, where what we initially view as just a, a unit sphere that we were happily manipulating around as if it was a 3D object. Um, sometimes it morphs to look like a plane, but then if we uh, change the other quaternion appropriately, it kind of gets back in place. And the goal with the, is around like two hours, if you take into consideration the initial videos I made and then the interactive experience thereafter, the goal is that someone can play with it and get to a point where they understand what the quaternions are doing in 4D, and in particular, why this sandwich between Q and Q inverse gives you these sorts of orientations in 3D space. Um, today, we don't necessarily have time to go through the full uh, details there, but the main reason I wanted to bring up this example was to describe the other instance for where programming your visuals, rather than just you know, having a very skillful drawing or some good schematic, where actually programming it uh, can be helpful. And that's when you put the controls in the hands of the learner, right? where you're giving them an environment where they can test their own hypotheses. And you know, I'm, I'm actually curious at this point, because there is one final actual point that I want to make with it all. Uh, between these three particular examples, which ones do you, as the audience, think um, actually require programmatic visualizations, right? For which of the three, if you had to do just one, which of the three do you think the computer graphics are actually the most necessary for understanding the math underlying it? So in the first case with double pendulums, you know, we're not talking about the math of how they evolve in terms of the physics and, you know, figuring out the equations for how they move, but uh, the description of what is chaos, you know, the idea of sensitivity to initial conditions and really communicating that as a phenomenon. Um, in the context of linear algebra, it's the idea of how one can think about matrices as linear transformations. And then in the context of something like quaternions, it's being able to use it as a programmer if you wanted to, saying, hey, I need to describe 3D orientation in some way. Can I, you'd be using a library probably, but it, it's helpful often, especially if you're debugging, to be able to look at a quaternion and know in principle what it's supposed to be describing. Um, can you get to the point of being able to do that? to look at a quaternion, know what orientation in 3D space it's supposed to describe. For which of these um, are computer graphics most necessary? And even though answers are rolling in, I'll go ahead and finish and reveal here. It looks like most people would say quaternions, after that the double pendulum and linear algebra being uh, least, but, but pretty even split all around, definitely not unanimity here. And I would say that I do agree that it is quaternions but for a very different reason, actually, if I look at all three of these examples and I ask, what role does programming serve? Um, it actually has nothing to do with generating the visual material for an explanation. And if we want to talk about helping people to understand math, the first step to that is to actually care about it in the first place. And one of the most delightful things that computer graphics offers for quaternions is that it kind of digs up this otherwise uh, I don't want to say dead subject matter in math. Mathematicians do care about quaternions, but they had a heyday when Hamilton initially invented them, where it was thought that these were going to be the way we describe 3D space. And then they fell by the wayside and people were happier using cross products and dot products. But the fact that they were revived in a programming context, um, it was because it was useful. It, it, it gives you this landscape where you can actually play with them. Whereas otherwise, you know, when I first learned about quaternions, it was as this curiosity. Now, I'm a nerd, and I was into that just as a curiosity, but I understand that for a lot of people, merely saying, look at the things that can happen in four dimensions that don't in three, doesn't necessarily motivate in the same way as saying, hey, we actually need to interpolate between 
two different orientations, and it needs to always work. We don't need any of these edge cases. And similarly, if you want to say, you know, what does computer graphics do for linear algebra? You don't really need programming to generate any particular visual. Like I said, it's nice to create a medium where you can do it a little bit more quickly or create the tooling for yourself. But if there's one way that computer graphics acts in the service of students understanding linear algebra, it's that students who want to create games or create um, you know, any pretty visual find themselves needing to understand matrices. It gives you the context where they're required. And if we back up to the very first example of this instance of a student in UC Davis playing around with simulations for a double pendulum. For me, I don't know, this actually helps remind me of something that I think I often overlook if I'm putting together material, which ends up being a static video that is me giving a lecture to the internet broadly, um, where the way that he created this, the tool that he was using was actually a tool that I made. It's called Manum. And it's, it's nothing to write home about, to be honest. It's, a lot of you out there will know the feeling when you put together your own set of uh, tools and scrappy programs for the sake of creating um, just some visualizations. But I decided to try to make it somewhat clean so that people could play with it and make it open source. So if they wanted to adapt it, and a lot of people really ran with it. Now there's a whole community that created a fork of it that has done much better things with it. And so you take the student who wants to play around with something, you offer some mixture of videos out there that give some inspiration. He listed a different particular video inspiring him for that particular visualization, that video itself, was something that was, uh, it seems like it's re-uploaded from a much older documentary. Um, you have him assemble this different set of tooling to be able to be in that environment playing himself. He inspires someone else to go and create a WebGL version of that, thereby playing around with the same math behind that double pendulum. I can almost guarantee that if we're talking about who's getting the best mathematical experiences out of things, those who are actually taking the ideas in their own minds and saying, hey, I want to see how this plays out, they're the ones who actually benefit the most from this. So if we're wondering, you know, when do visualizations help you in understanding math? The honest answer is when you're putting it in the hands of the students, when they're the ones creating the program. And I think it's very easy to lose sight of that when you're using it in the service of creating visualizations that ostensibly are the medium of explanation themselves. So with that, I'll, I'll turn to Discord and uh, answer some questions um, after the talk, but it looks like the time is about up here. So I want to say thank you for attending, and uh, I'll hop over to that Discord and see you there.